I got two awesome guests today. We're going to talk about cold email. Uh, first up, I got Tyson Chang. He lives in Portland, pretty close to me. He was one of the first 10 SDR hires at Zoom Info and has sort of worked his way up from there. And Tyson, what, uh, you're running a team of what, 40, 50 people, I think you said now? Yeah, just just uh, just under 50 fluctuates about 10 reps directly and a couple managers and then, you know, whatever operations means these days, but do some of that stuff too. Yeah, so got a team that's sending out a lot of cold outreach for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, KD, and we've collaborated before Tyson. KD, we've done this a lot of times as well. And uh, KD has spent the better part of, I think, a decade or a little over a decade now running inside sales teams. And um, cold email is something that you talk about a lot. We've talked about it a lot in the past. And uh, you also host one of my favorite sales podcasts, the Live Better, Sell Better podcast. So KD, good to have you, my man. Pump, pump, my man. I'm still waiting. Do you remember you did this? This was two, three years ago. You asked like a video testimony, like where will cold email be in five years? Do you remember what my answer was to that? You said it would be illegal. Yep. And I, it is starting to age yeah. really well. So we, got, we got about two and a half more years left on that clock. And I'm going to come back to that bad boy and see like, yeah. told you. Yeah. So yeah. let's kind of start there because I think that naturally the question I get asked a lot is how do we balance mass blast, you know, versus quality? And I think that word balance and finding a middle ground is important because obviously it doesn't make sense to just handcraft every single email that you send. I mean, it doesn't make sense to do that. And the data would show that that isn't necessarily the most effective way to do it either. Um, So I'll go ahead and kick this first question your way, Katie. How do you, just in your experience and with running teams, how do you think about kind of the numbers part of the equation versus the quality part of the equation? So where, funny enough, where I'd start with what what you said there, right, is I would encourage people to test it. And by the way, anyone on this webinar, everything that we talk about, you need to test for yourself to see like what works well for you and your industry. There is no silver bullet in this. But I hear a lot of pushback on personalization in terms of like, well, it takes too much time or the return isn't there. But at the same time, I know a lot of people aren't actually doing it. So do we actually know how much time it takes? Do we know the, what the results could be? Because even going from a 1% response rate to a 5% response rate is a five times higher response rate. So wouldn't that be worth spending a little bit more time, right? So so the balance, right, is I'm looking at one, there's different buckets of leads, right? Not To me, not every lead should be getting heavy personalization. But also, personalization to me doesn't have to be heavy. I'm talking about one sentence is better than what most people are doing. That's not a lot of time to, to go through, right? So I look at, okay, my A's and B's should be getting at least two to three personalized touches. That is my opinion. They should be getting at least two to three personalized touches within that outreach process. And then later on in the sequence, there can be a little bit more of the templates that are to the persona or whatever else. But like personalization matters, y'all, even more. And what's interesting is like as response rate comes down, people are focused on volume more as opposed to making sure what they're sending out is better. So I'll pause there. But like the balance to me is like, I I don't view it as balance. I believe if it's an A or B type account or lead, they should be getting at least two to three personalized email touches early on in that process. And then it can start going more into templates. So let's dig into that, Tyson, a little bit, uh, because you guys do a bunch of different type of stuff at Zoom Info. And to Katie's point, it's looking at my prospect list, not as just one big list that I work from top to bottom. It's like there's certain little pockets in here that are worth spending more time on versus less time. How do you guys think about prioritization at Zoom Info? Yeah. Um, polarizing question, right? Because uh, I want to send a personalized email to everyone, but anyone who thinks spray and pray doesn't work, right? Obviously hasn't tried it or hasn't sort of evolved it the right way. I don't think it'll help you hit your number, but to, uh, to Kevin's point, having that sort of ABC priority, um, we lean on it a little bit more on the follow-up side. So I asked my team to send five to 10 personalized emails per day as a follow-up to a cold call, as a follow-up to a no or send me information. And so we're using our, you know, emailing or sequencing a lot of the times as anchors to a cold call, right? I think an email is only as good as that follow-up. 
Um, but I think every rep, you know, should have five, 10 people per day that you're sending out emails that are going to be super personalized, referencing the webinar that Kevin's hosting today at 10 o'clock, referencing, you know, an article you posted a while back on LinkedIn or, or a new job posting because you're the VP of sales and you're hiring. Like there are just so many really easy levers. Um, one of the best rules that we always had was the three by three rule, right? Three pieces of information in three minutes. If you can't find that, just move on. And we talked about in cold calling as well. It's the exact same for emailing. And in fact, when you're doing that cold call or that cold call prep, you're just taking that same prep and putting it into an email. It's the exact same thing. And you're just building on that message. Yeah. I was hoping you to get on that because like that's the thing is like if y'all, y'all, if you're not going to personalize, then stop researching. Period. <laughs> stop researching because you're not using it. So that right. that's what always cracks me up is like, and again, we can talk bluntly here and openly here. We hear like, you know, SDRs and AEs like take so much time to research an account and then not send personalized emails. Then what were you researching the account for in the first place? Right. At that point, then you should just be templating everything because you weren't researching. The only reason you researched was so you can personalize, right? Make it relevant. Right. And I love some of the things that are popping up here. Right. Like I would challenge all y'all. And I know I'm an easy example. Go write me a personalized email. How long would that take you to do? Like if you research someone, that's a one line and you go. So if you're researching, you should be personalizing. If you're not, then don't. Save yourself all the time, just cold call and send templates. But then your activity needs to be higher. That's the other side of this, is if you're not personalizing your messaging, so you're saving time there, then your call activity should be way higher because you're not even applying the personalization. Yeah. And then your email activity will follow right after that, right? Mm -hmm. You're having all these follow-ups, these continual touches. I'll check in in two weeks, six months. And then you put them in a sequence, right? You say like, hey, checking in. Is this still relevant? And you can schedule that stuff to go out a month from now, right? With all the email automation. So you can really set it and forget it, past bubble stuff, like just that repeatable process with that personalization even. Love it. Yeah. And what I'm hearing there too is the, it's knowing, knowing your sales math. You talk about that a lot, KD. And it's, there's multiple ways you can hit your number. If, cause some people are just those volume people. They'll get up and be like, dude, I'm going to crank out 150 calls today. You know, and there are some people that want to take that more quality approach. What I'm kind of hearing from both of you is it doesn't really matter as long as you have a way that's consistent for you to hit your number. Like there's a blend of these two uh, things. I, I, no, not quite because there's repercussions, right? I can't hit my number through spray and pray, but there's repercussions to that because yes, I sent out 200 emails and yes, I got my two meetings out of that, but there were 198 that I did not. So you also still need to weigh the repercussion as well. So I just wanna call that out, is like getting to your number can't be the only thing that we focus on. Because shoot, if I need to hit 10 opportunities, then yeah, I could send out 10,000 emails and I'd probably get my 10 opportunities. But the repercussions of that are different. So I do just wanna call that part out. Well, let's, let's maybe define what we mean by spray and pray then. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'll I'll start first. What I hear when I hear spray and pray is I'm going to send the same exact email to a VP of sales, a VP of inside sales, a director of uh, sales enablement. That's also a persona I sell to. And then an inside sales manager. That's what I hear is just the same thing regurgitated. Is that kind of what you guys are thinking? Because there's different kinds of elements of doing something at scale with no personalization in it that don't kind of fit into that bucket. But I'm curious, just we'll start with you, Tyson. Like when you hear spray and pray, what does that actually mean to you? Let's let's define what we're talking about. That is a great question because I that is not what I think of spray and pray. I think of sequences by persona and industry to determine the fit. And so if you're a founder, a CEO, a VP of sales, you should all be getting different sequences in my opinion. But I can still drop you in that automation and say, hey, a lot of VPs of sales that I talk to are struggling with this. Is this relevant to you? You know, yes, no, follow up, you know, can I get a referral? Hey, I'll back off for now, or I'm going to call you later today. Um, That's what I think of a spray and pray now. A hundred percent. If you're just got one blanket email and I've seen, I get on customer calls here at zoom info. They say, Hey, our data is not, the data is not working for us. We're not getting responses. First thing I say is show me your email sequence. And then they got like a, 
a picture, 20 bullet points. Here's everything that we do, right? Would love to connect to learn about your you know, entire life. It's like no one's going to respond to those and you're sending that to everyone. So it's not personalized. So hundred percent, like you should have a really clear mapping of your ideal customer profile, target industries, personas, and then what they all care about. And that should be broken out into, you know, five, six things that they care about. And each one of those things that they care about by persona is a different sequence. And then once you created that template, you A-B test it a little bit, you have reps provide input, and then you send it out just to those people, not one email to, you know, 12 people, one company that'll get you blacklisted, like no one's business. Yeah. Katie, what do you think? How do you, when we are talking spray and pray, mass blast, that kind of stuff, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's a one, it's a lack of personalization and a lack of customization, which we also haven't really distinguished the differences between, right? So to me, customization is what you do to the account or the persona, right? So the examples you gave, right, Jay Bay, like you customize for enablement, you customize for director, you customize for VP because they're going to have different problems, different languages, right? Most people don't even do that. They're just talking about their product the same way to everybody. So they're not even customizing to the personas. Personalization, I don't know how many people we got on here. I know almost got a thousand people on here. But what's the first part of the word personalization? It's person, right? Personalization means only that person can read it and it makes sense, right? So if someone emailed you, j and said, hey, I saw that you're a black hat aficionado on your LinkedIn, but I assume when you're trying to set pipeline, you like more white hat tactics than black hat tactics. I was wondering if I could show you how we could do that for you. That wouldn't make sense to you because you are not a what? You're not a black hat aficionado, right? Yeah. I was Only, thinking like black hat, like, uh, you but know, it's in my LinkedIn. So I'm using it. <laughs> yeah. that, that we'll get into how you connect the dots yeah. to make it relevant, but that's only, I could get that email and it makes sense. That's yeah. personalization. So to me, spray and pray is lacking customization and lacking personalization. It's just saying, Hey, yeah. I'm KD. I can help make your managers better at their job. We should talk. And just yeah. that type of, when no customization to persona or account that's spray and pray. Yeah, yeah, got it. I think it's super important to define that because Tyson, I mean, just to both your points, there's you're not going to have a lot of credibility issues if you're sending a pretty relevant message to someone that's not personalized. You're not going to get a lot of people hitting unsubscribe with that. Okay. It's when stuff is just like so out of the wheelhouse of what that person would care about. That's where people start to get pissed off. So I want to shift gears a bit here because with email, before we get into email structure, which is going to be where we spend probably half the time, just everyone watching, uh, I want to talk about email deliverability. And one thing we could do to just kind of engage the audience here in the chat, let us know what is your philosophy on links in cold emails? Include your email signature too. Should you have them? Should you not have them? Should you limit them? Let us know. What do you guys think about hyperlinking in emails? email signatures, all of that kind of stuff. Let us know in the chat. <laughs> this will be kind of fun because there's a lot of opinions. On crazy. This and I have some opinions and I think there's some stuff, Katie, I know we had like kind of some back and forth in my post. Yeah. I think there's some stuff that people are not a hundred percent sure on either where you just got to do a bunch of testing. And there are people out there that have done that, but yeah, some people are like no links one to two max. Maybe in the CTA, some people use three. So it's kind of all over the place. I think the number one thing that we want to talk about before what the email should be structured like and what we should say is, and you always say this, Katie, you know, people can't reply to an email that they never get. They can't open an email that they never get either. So uh, I want to kick this first question your way, Katie. When it comes to deliverability, what are you really focused on in your work right now and where are people kind of missing the mark when it comes to how do we make sure that email actually makes it through and gets delivered? Yeah. So there, there's a few parts of this. One is warming up the domains, right? It's like warming up the, the domains that you are sending from and not just starting from a cold, you know, setup. Right, because those domains are not ready yet, right? They're treated as brand new and Google doesn't like that. Outreach doesn't like that, where it's brand new account. So think about this, right? The account KD at Outbound Squad has never existed before. All of a sudden it exists and all of a sudden it's sending hundreds of emails out per day. 
Google is like, nope, we know. We know what's happening here. So it gets flagged. So one, you want to warm them up. There's different tools out there that that do this. Like, you know, like Mailshake is a company that does this like for there. There's warmer, I think warm box, there's warm, there's a few out there. It's like you need to warm up the domains. The second is, and this is what the on the post, right? This started a whole chain of me researching too, is you should have separate domains you're sending from. Because if every email from your company is coming from, you know, outboundsquad.com, every marketing email, every SER email, every AE email, all that, that again can hurt the domain if someone is out there spraying and praying, right? And getting flagged as spam. So now it only takes one SDR to jack up the whole domain. One person can ruin that domain for everybody. And so can you marketing. If we have any marketing people out of here, y'all can jack this up too with your nurture emails and shit. Sorry for cussing. But so that's the other part is other domains. So like, you know, get dot outbound squad or get outbound squad.com. Try outbound squad.com. The real outbound, like you get different domains, right? To send from. So making sure you're warming up the domains, you have different domains to do. And then you're looking at like the content of those emails, right? So links for sure. And a lot of here, y'all listening, go check your signatures. Because as much as everyone here is like, oh, yeah, only one link in the email, go check your signature because you might have the Facebook link, the LinkedIn link, the social link in there, a link to your calendar, your phone number shows up as a link and a link to your company website all in your signature. So your body is fine, but your signature has seven or eight links in it. So you want to be careful with links. You would never send something to download, right? That's important as well. Things to download will fall apart very, very quickly, but it's the domains first. Warm them up. There's tools that can do this for you. Then you get to different domains, making sure that you have different domains to send from. Check then the what's in your emails. And also for deliverability, I'll pass it to Tyson. Avoid spammy words. Free, free, discount, limited time, offer, dollar sign, dollar sign. Big one too. things like that trigger Google and these inboxes go like that's spam because you would never send an email to someone you know saying free. <laughs> like I would like email my mom like, hey, I've got a free something for you. I would call my mom. I would call a friend oh. with something <laughs> Right. So well, you, you don't you don't have you don't have Asian parents, KD. Right, that, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so a couple a couple quick things there just uh uh before we kick it your way, Tyson. So I think links, it sounds like one link tops. Um try in the signature to have I would assume that that would be in what I've always taught is the link to the website. You know, just like put one link in there. And then the other thing too. We dropped a link in here so you guys could check it out. Mail Tester is a really great tool. Like if you just fire off an email to there, it'll tell you what the spam score is and what's not set up correctly. And warming up those email domains. Mm-hmm. So if you're new at your team or you're running a team of people and you're hiring, like it's such an important point to like when that person's email address is set up, don't be firing off emails right away off of that. Like there's a whole warm up sequence that you can take it through. Uh, Tyson, on your end though, how do you guys think about deliverability and what are some of the kind of no-nos? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, uh, just being Zoom Info, deliverability is probably our number one priority when it comes to you know the tools that we have never bounced and then our platform being verified. And you know, the way that we can scale the um, the deliverability basically or the confidence score, as we call it, between like an A plus and a C, that really helps us prioritize to make sure we're protecting our domain to uh, to Kevin's point. We use, you know at email.zoominfo.com. And we've cycled through a few domains because the most important thing with email deliverability is just getting your message in front of the prospect, even if your message is bad, right? If it gets there, at least you're playing the numbers. Now, don't want you to send bad messages, but you know that's important. Calendar links, um, I, I include them. I think most of our reps do, but our reps also have very different uh, signatures between our engaged tool and our Gmail signature. So... When I send out emails to engage our, our email automation tool, that signature is super bland, right? And it has a link to our calendar most of the time, but that's the only link 
plus a link to our website. And then when I reply in Gmail, yeah, maybe I'll include my social. I can include other things or include more links because that domain's opened up once they reply on on that side. Um, and then, you know, I love that article, that HubSpot article. I actually have pinned as one of my enablement things. I send all my reps of, you know, spam words to avoid. It's a great article. Uh, if you didn't catch that in the chat, scroll up. Um, multiple domains, social links I never include. But uh, I think one of the things I talk about with a lot of customers as well is your outbound and this is you know every outbound rep's going to hate doing this but part of sending cold outbound emails is to generate inbound leads right you want to direct people to your website you want to capture their attention you want to score their engagement right if they're clicking on links downloading content from your cold email and you can sort of trace that back we used to call it inbound for outbound but I don't need someone to reply to my email. If they click on the link and they see something that catches their eye, like I'm trying to tell that connected story, which um, Jason's post that you alluded to, which I'm sure we're going to get to in terms of the email structure is like, you know, what's the problem? How can we help? Um, here's, you know, a little bit of information that may be relevant to you. Don't believe me, click on this link or go check out our website and do your own research. Or here's some referrals that we could connect you to. I'm going to call you later today at 2 p.m. It's just part of the entire story that you're trying to connect along the path. You're giving them options to respond, whether it's the email, whether it's a cold call, whether it's reply to a voicemail, whether it's filling out a form on the website. Um, so I, I, I don't think uh, you definitely shouldn't have a lot of links, obviously no downloads, but um, I like the email link because I, I get free demos that way all the time. Mm -hmm. Someone will just click, hey, grab time on your calendar. <laughs> so I want to ask you guys about attachments real quick before we shift into structure. What's the consensus on attachments in cold emails before a prospect has replied to you? Never. Yeah. Yeah. Never. yeah. <laughs> That's Mindcast will flag it on our side. Are you sure you want to download it? Are you sure you want to click on this? And as soon as I get that from a cold email, I'm not clicking through, right? I'm not going to put my company at risk. Last thing I want to do is, you know, get an email from my IT department saying, Hey, you failed the fourth, you know, spam, you know, test that we've had in the last three weeks. So you have to do is, you know, training again. <laughs> Yep. So Vince, Abay, there you go. No attachments. Okay. I thought I'd do something kind of fun here for email structure. Okay. And this is not to throw any of these people under the bus that we're about to share because some of them are good, but I thought it'd be kind of cool to show you guys the cold emails I get in Tyson KD. I'd love to, and just in the audience, get your take. So at first, let's just mark these unread. So I'm one of those do you guys do this, by the way? Do you save the cold emails that you get? Oh, <laughs> or am I, the only uh, that does this? I, I delete the bad ones. <laughs> I delete the bad ones and I forward the good ones to my team <laughs> and, and my marketing so, team. Say, hey, I like this structure. This was good. We should steal some pieces from this. So let's talk about just the very, very first impression, because I think this is this is like such an important thing, that subject line plus that preview text. When you guys look at these, what are the patterns that stick out to you, good or bad? Well, I mean, let us know in the chat too. Let yeah. us know in the chat too as you're looking at this. There's, like, there's a big thing, like for me. Someone asked this earlier, right? Is like, what's what are the best subject lines, right? It's like, okay, some of these are just huge, right? Where it's like, all right, I'm putting everything in the subject line, so it's all very long. Request for meeting, absolutely not. Meeting request, absolutely not. Because I already know what that email is about. I don't have to read it. Don't even want to know about what that meeting request is. Um. The preview text, I'm trying to find one here. No, no. I like no. the referral. No. I see, do you know uh, Kalani? I'm assuming Jason. No, I don't. In, in, this, in the so, second so one. Here, so y'all, I want you to look at this real quick, real quick. What do we have here? How many emails are here, j -Bay? What do we got? 20? Not one of the first sentences is personalized. Not one. There's not a single personalized first sentence out of any of these. The, I don't see a single one, right? Like that to me is the biggest pattern I'm not seeing is there's not when I'm looking at an email and y'all do this too. When you get an email, you look at the, the first sentence first, then the subject line, right? I don't see a single one in here that is personalized to you. 
Nope. So that's that's the first. The second, I do like from Evan Turner, outbound squad plus times payload or payload. I do like those as short and sweet subject lines of getting the company name in front of people. I do like that one. This The yeah. one subject line, someone called it out. I didn't know you were a fellow Pacific Northwesterner. Are you a Pacific Northwesterner, JB? I am. I responded to that email too. There we go. So that's so the only one. The email's heavy. Better. <laughs> But it's very clear that this is for me. Right. That's yeah. them. I, I hardly ever respond to people, like even, especially if I'm taken care of. A little shout out to Neon there. That's mm-hmm. uh, yeah. That's the only one. And Sarah, by the way, is my wife. She we started our business together, so her old emails get forwarded over to me because someone asked. Um, Tyson, what do you think? Um, you I, I'd be curious for Neon. Did Neon call you after you sent that email? No, that's a whole conversation for another time. I get, okay. I never get called. And that's, like that's, UKD, that's like it's not like my stuff's not in Zoom info and uh, whatever other you know kind of platforms are out yeah. there. But yeah, so no, yep. my number one uh, response to every email for any person's like, hey, can you help me respond to this email? It's like, did you call them? Pick up the phone and call them right now. Leave a voicemail. Hey, I got your email. I'll respond later today. I was hoping to catch you for fifteen minutes. Um, yep. That will always garner better responses and nothing will get lost in translation. So yeah, hit the phones. Absolutely, Eddie. Um, I like the outbound squad payload, like company, mm-hmm. short, sweet. It kind of looks like a meeting invite, so I may be more inclined to click it. I saw someone say they don't like the replies, but I always get caught with that because I hate missing emails. And so if someone hits like reply and they're just replying to their own email, like I'm actually inclined to click on it a little bit more. Um just because it's like, wait, did I reply to this? Let me just make sure. Okay, it's just their reply bubbling this back up. So I like reply emails. Um, I think it's a good way to bubble up the content that you sent in the first email if it's personalized. So you yep. say, hey, following up on this, you know, am I completely off base here? Is this something that you care about? Um, I can't tell like the five proof, the five day proof of concept. I can't tell if that's like a white paper link or a personalized email. There's a lot there that look like, Hey, this is educational, but I'm assuming a lot of them are trying to get time on your calendar to, to talk through stuff. Um, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Kevin, like sending out educational stuff and like making it obvious, like, Hey, thought this might catch your, catch your eye or. I'm okay with it. But to your point, I send those in the, what I also don't see as a subject line is, just left you a voicemail. Yeah. Yep. I click on those. That like, I just left you a voicemail that gets opened. Right. And then you're saying like what's in it. So I'm all for sending content that they can engage with, but I am either sending it late, like later in the sequences, just to see if I can get some engagement. Right. Or it needs to be something they can use. So at patient pop, we had something called the competitive scanner where it actually was valuable. Where like, hey, you could fill this out and know where you ranked against your competition, everything else. We led with that a lot of, hey, we have this competitor scanner. It'll let you see where you rank from blah, 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 blah. Check it out. And this is also what's important with links is the call to action has to be the link. So that, you know, they've done the studies on this. If you have an email, it has more than two calls to action, meaning watch this and respond click this and let me know. Those are two calls to action. Your response rate will get cut in half with two calls to action. If I want you to click on something, that's all I'm telling you to do. Click on this. Check this article out. Here's why I think you'll find it valuable. That's it. Because also what I'm using emails for, and Tyson, this is what you and I were vibing with um, the last time we were chatting, is I'm also sending emails to find out who I should call. (laughs) Because the person that clicked on that link that's who I want to call. That's someone who's engaged. They're a little bit more curious than it. So we had a clicker's cadence. Who's clicked? That's my clicker's cadence. Who's engaged a little bit. They're going to get some extra calls and some extra personalization from us. I'll go find it, Sue. But yes, they studied on the number of like calls to action to dropping it by over 50%. So I'll go find the the report for you. Yeah. It's just a good marketing principle in general that Anytime they introduce too many options on a website or a landing page, people overall just tend to click less on stuff because there's like this like overwhelm of like choice. So if we just kind of backtrack a bit, 
So subject lines, we gave a few. I love this concept and I want to sort of make this very explicit that both of you guys are big fans of leaving voicemails and using them as a way to get people to open emails or with emails saying, just left you a voicemail. There's a couple subject lines that I really like there. The one that you mentioned, uh, Katie, you know, hey, Katie, just left a voicemail. Uh, the second one I like, I got this from a rep that I work with. That I thought was really cool because it looks like a notification. It's voicemail from Jason Bay. And it looks like a notification that someone would get from a voicemail. He had a really high open rate with that and, and a good reply rate. When it comes to subject lines, I've always, not always, I'm more so now gravitated towards stuff that's like four words or less, like super just like straight to the point. You're either going to go really customized and say, hey, J-Bay, blah, 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 or I'm going to keep it incredibly simple, short and sweet. Uh, Tyson, I'll start with you. What's the philosophy on subject lines for you guys? Um, if you've seen someone else use it, probably don't use it, right? Like you want to have that like creative mindset, um, and trying to like think of new ones, like experiment, especially if you're doing like the five to 10 people per day and it's off a follow up or you give them a few calls, like, Hey, shot you over a voicemail. Um, you know, what's going to give you a call tomorrow at two or, uh, you know, obviously not that in the subject line, I put that in the body line, but left voicemail, call at two o'clock question mark. Right. And see if they'll respond to that. Say, no, I'm busy at two. Um, you know, based on what we sell, right. To sales and marketing and professionals, um, uh, intent is a big thing that we offer where we can, you know, look at keywords and say like enablement or people looking up enablement right now. Right. And I'd send them a screenshot of people, companies that are actively doing research on enablement. And then, Hey, would these just, do you want me to get in front of these decision makers? You open for 15 minutes. Like we're selling to salespeople. So if you give them free leads, almost every salesperson like is inclined to click on this. Um, or your CEO wanted me to send you over these leads, uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, worth another conversation um, to get you in front of more clients this year. Um, anything like that. Like I, I, four words. I've been known to write six, seven, eight word subject lines, but usually it's really personalized or it's it's trying to get them hooked on something very specific that we offer. One thing I actually hate. Um, sorry if anyone from Zoom Info's on here, but I hate every time we acquire a company and we we send out like, Hey, look at, we just acquired this company, like check us out and do all this stuff. Like that stuff I feel like drowns out what we're actually trying to do and get them in front of, you know, the kid, the, the, the unified platform and like the overall messaging that we all hear internally, but I think gets lost a lot of times when you just send out those product updates and that's a marketing function, obviously not a, not a sales function. Yeah. What about you, Katie? So we're still kind of like on subject lines, right? In terms of just like where to to go there. And I'm seeing it popping up a little bit in, you know, like the chats here of like, just give us the best ones. Here's the thing, y'all. We can't give a best subject line because we're not targeting your persona. So the key to a great subject line is using language that your personas would use. So how do your personas describe their challenges? How do their persona, what's the day-to-day of your persona? What do they deal with? How do they describe your product? What are the things in your industry, right? That would be relevant to me. So like I'm going after, this, this would be a perfect one. If I was targeting someone for cold email and the subject line said, cold email open rates are 30% of what they used to be six months ago. That would only work for someone who cares about cold email. That would not work for a school teacher. Right. But the framework of a great subject line is what would get their curiosity. And the only way you can do that is knowing what your persona and industries care about. Right. What do your personas care about? How do they talk about it? And I do believe in I like the I switch back and forth between like, you know, just putting our names close to each other. Right. J Bay, you know, X. KD, right? So you're seeing the names there, right? Harris just dropped it. I love that format for sure. Because now, even if you didn't open my email, what have you seen? Even if you didn't open the email, you've seen my company name, which builds a little bit of awareness. It builds a little bit of familiarity. But then I'm switching back to what would resonate with that persona, right? Or if we're doing personalization, KD, where do you buy your black hats from? That would be a personalized subject line that I know was only written to me. So for everyone listening here, you need to know your personas because anytime we are using a subject line that we think will work for everyone, we can almost guarantee it won't work for anybody, right? Because it's not 
custom there. That's when it becomes gimmicky. Actually, I'll give one. I'll give one to y'all. Anyone here want a really good subject line that's almost guaranteed to get a lot of opens? Your checking account. Your credit card balance. Go try that out, y'all. I bet you you get a lot of opens. I bet you you do, right? Here's another one I'll give you that I guarantee will give you a good open rate. Open this email if you never want me to email you again. There you go. Okay. So like, that's where I need, like, there needs to be some ownership here, right? Of like, hey, right. And y'all are catching it, right? (laughs) I'd get open rates, but y'all see it. Everyone would be mad at that email, but the open rate would be there. It's not about the gimmicks. Nail the language of persona. What do they care about and what do they talk about? That'd be a good one, Nathan. Like <laughs> outbreak. That oh, one for good. sure. Do it, right? Like those types of things. So that would be my rec- recommendation of like, hey, know their language. And then like that's one, like, you know, if John to that one, like closing, you know, our activity. It's if I care or not, right? Do I care if you're not going to reach out to me? This is my last attempt. Do I care if it's your last attempt versus we need to fix this? So that's like for people looking for tactics here, the language matters more than the the getting something gimmicky. Yeah. Yeah. I got one thing I want to. Oh, go ahead, Tyson. Go ahead. I was just say another good one, probably more on the gimmicky side, but can work is just recent events. Super Bowls, you know, you're something happening in that person's geographical location. Um, Just to reference that in the subject line, like, hey, you joining the parade in Philadelphia, right? Are you you joining this? Are you doing that? Um, We've had some success with that stuff. Um, Same with like, you know, the uh, Equifax credit or uh, data breach, right? We we sent out a big message there and, and it was about data, even though it doesn't really relate to us. It was an easy thing to get open to those, you know, a real world event. I have some, cause people are wanting to see examples. I have some examples for you guys too. So just to double down on what KD said there, I had a client that sells hardware, uh, automated welding solution. So it's hardware and software as a service for large manufacturers. So p- p- picture people that like manufacture large trailers, let's say for example, you know, the number one thing on their mind is welding talent. There's a huge shortage of it and there's a huge need of it. 90% open rate with one word subject line, welders. Uh, I got another client because people are asking in the chat, well, kind of hard to sum up a persona in two words. It's actually not. Like in two to four words. I'll give you that. You got up to four words. Like there's another client I work with that sells into customer support leadership roles and they sell a customer experience solution. The number one thing on their mind is reducing cost to serve or reducing inbound call volume. This is the number one these thing these people are thinking about. That's how you like create a really relevant subject line and also be able to kind of do it at scale with that persona. But I'm a really big fan, I don't know about you guys, I call them boring subject lines. I think people try to get too creative with a subject line. Like I would rather err on the side of being relevant and obvious than like really creative with something they've never seen before. Yeah. It's it's like, cause there's no, right. There's no such thing as like boring or not. It's interesting or uninteresting, right? You send me a a subject line that says, you know, I don't know. It'd be a good example. Like, Ooh, like, you know, coding optimization doesn't mean anything to me, but send that to someone who's learning how to do no code. And it might be. Right. So it's nailing it. If you, I, JB, I love the point you made. If you can't identify the problems of your personas in four or less words, it means you don't know your personas. You don't. You just don't. It's so you, obvious. Like, if you can't do it, you don't know your personas. And that will affect your subject line, your first sentence, and your email copy, because no matter what, your copy is not going to resonate. And your closing rates. <laughs> now, well, this is about cold email. We didn't talk about yeah. cold email. Yeah. <laughs> Um, All of it, another boring email. Uh, yeah, let's get into email structure. So, what are kind of the philosophies? And I'll start with you, Katie. Uh, email structure. I also have. If either of you two have examples, feel free. Let me know. We can share those. I have an example of a, an email that's working pretty good too. But, KD, email structure. What are your kind of general philosophies and thoughts around like structure? Once someone's decided, hey, I'm going to give you a couple seconds here. I'm going to open this email and see what's up. Yep. Yeah, so what, what I teach to, to my team and uh, uh, Bonnie can speak to it. What up, Bonnie? See you on here. Um, we teach KPIC, 
And KPIC stands for No Problem Impact Call to Action. KPIC. Here's what I know. And that's generally what I know about you or your company or your persona. Problem. Here are some common problems that you're probably seeing or dealing with. We're seeing this across the board. Impact. Here's what those problems are causing. Call to action. What would I like you to do? Or when I'm, especially in cold email, my personal favorite call to actions early, I'm actually just looking for agreement. Does this sound like your world? Are you noticing this? Is this something you're seeing? Am I way off base here? I am not asking for a meeting. I am not asking for 30 minutes of their time. I'm asking like, are you noticing this or not? And something tested um, relatively recently, I actually combined it with, because if not, I'll stop reaching out. Yeah. If you're not seeing this, just tell me, I'll stop reaching out. So the, the, the C Hughes was called to action. So here's what I know about you or your persona, right? Here's the problems. Here's the impact of those problems. Call to action, right? You notice in this, you see in this too, is this in your world? Do you care about this at all? Am I way off base? Am I wrong here? Short, sweet. All you're looking for is that response. So that's the framework. And that's what keeps your emails short and sweet too, right? These, these aren't crazy long emails. Here's what I know about you. Here's the problem. Impacts of those problems. Call to action. That's the framework that, that I teach and have seen very, very good results with. But notice it does require you to know your persona. Right. That K is the first letter for a reason. You need to know that persona. You need to know that account. You need to know that person to make it work. There's a very clear like the problem impact that's kind of like the current state versus the future state, the before, the after. It's a very straightforward, very simple messaging framework that has worked for as long as there has been billboards in messaging and marketing and people talking to each other and all that kind of stuff. Um, so. I dropped this into the chat, you guys, so that you have it. Yeah. Because also, I want to talk about that while we're going through it, because this is important, y'all. When you are prospecting, you have to talk about the now. You can't talk about the future because I can't identify with the future. So, a lot of, pro I bet if we went in and read some of those prospecting emails, JB, we hear all future based language. We'll make things better, faster whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's all future. We will 3X your pipeline. We will 2X. It's all future-based versus not seeing the pipeline you want right now. That's now-based. I'm only going to talk to you if there's something now we need to talk about. Not you can 2X my pipeline when you don't even know what my pipeline is. Prospecting needs to be now-based, not future-based. Yeah. I love it. Tyson, what are your, what are your thoughts? That's, yeah, couldn't agree more. Like, how can you help the prospect now? That's going to get them to, to take action, not, you know. A lot of times, too, I think sellers are forgetting that when you reach out to people, a lot of the times you're trying to give them more work, right? You're trying to ask them to implement a new tool, to change their process, to commit more time, even though they're already working 40, 50 hours per week, doing something like what is really going to entice them. And it is exactly what... Um, what you mentioned, I love that. I was, I was taking notes, writing that down. I put it in the chat there as well because I put that in my my Slack little bot here. Um, but uh, if if you can help someone now meet the buyer where they're at now, and then our next philosophy is paint the vision for the future, right? That'll get people to close the deal. The helping them now will get them to you know answer the call and take the demo. So figuring out like what are your free gives, I think is important. Like what can you give away for free that someone can hold in their hand and feel like yeah, this is worth fifteen minutes to get. Zoom info, it's leads, right? It's a trial, right? You're going to get a deal. It's going to pay for itself. That's our talk track. Um, if you're selling to sales or marketing, I'll give you sort of our framework here. We use something called the sales velocity equation. That equals the number of opportunities times the average sales price times the win rate all over the length of the sale. Those are the four main variables that I'm trying to impact no matter what persona I'm selling to. So if you're sales, marketing, C-suite, CRO, even operations, if I can get you more opportunities, right? Here's how I can do it. If you're struggling doing that, let's connect. If I can increase your average sales price, here's how I can do it. Let's connect, right? If I can shorten your sales cycles, let's connect. If I can increase your win rate, get you in front of deals faster because you're 70% more likely to win the opportunity when you're the first uh, vendor in the door, 
let's connect. If that's something that's relevant to you, then that's the messaging, right? It's not, I'm not trying to sell them all the variables at once. It's like, hey, let's help you generate more opportunities. Not interested? Are you struggling with average sales or like increasing your sales price? Not interested? What about increasing your win rate? Are your deals too long? Hey, it looks like I missed. Let's, you know, let's reconnect at a later date. I tried giving you a call. I sent you the email. It doesn't work out. Um, I'll type that in the in the channel here uh, for the sales velocity equation. But if you don't have something like that for your persona broken out, then don't send an email, right? Mm-hmm. Figure that out first. Connect with your CEO. Connect with your marketing person. Connect with your manager. Map all that out. And then it's like Mad Lib, right? You're just plugging and playing into the same formula, which you know I think Kevin's going to cover more about the structure because I think he's a genius at that. Um, but then once you have all that, it's just plug and play, right? You don't have to think about it that much. I want to, I will do a quick test here, y'all. In the chat, what problem does your product solve? Throw it in the chat real quick. What problem does your product solve? Throw it in the chat real quick. Can I put another one? Five words or less? Oh, no, 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 no. We're just going to see what happens. Let's see what happens here. Okay. Now. Most of these are not problems. Damn it, JBay. Let it go a little bit. Let's see. JBay, come on, man. You're setting, up, <laughs> setting you up for an alley oop here. Okay. This is where a lot, damn, I forgot how many people are on this, but this <laughs> is where a lot of prospecting messaging misses. A lot of these are not problems. These are the solution. The problem is the opposite a lot of these things, right? So J-Bay gave it away and notice the answers changed once J-Bay called it out, right? When we put things through of like, you know, we simplify things. Well, the problem is the opposite of simplification, right? It's overcomplicated and overwhelming, right? Hold time. So what's the problem of hold times? The problem of hold times is frustrating customers and callback rates or whatever else. Email management is the solution. The problem, we need to nail the problem. And so oftentimes I'll go in and I'll look at someone's website and go, here's all the benefits for the problem you solve are the complete opposite. The problem you solve is the complete opposite. Faster bandwidth is the solution. So the opposite is slow bandwidth, unproductive bandwidth, right? It's the opposite. Of, there we go. Now, see, y'all are starting to get it. Too much data. Sell your connect order cancellation due. That's problem based language. Conf- ah, see now ah, I get excited with this when you start to see it start to click here. This is problem based language. This is what people can identify with. So this is fun. See how quick y'all learned that? See how quick, right? Hold that. that that's what we're looking for. Nope. I think uh, in a I love that little tag there. And I think an important note too is really speaking to the impact that that problem has for that someone that's uh, of that individual. So like when you see uh, confused users, Alan had put in there, like that's a good start. But I'm wondering if I'm reaching out to a VP, let's say uh, of customer experience, confused users equals churn. Right. That's the I. This is the P. This is the P. (laughs) Then we get to the I, right? So this last one, not enough CDL drivers. I'm talking to a lot of logistics companies right now. They are all struggling to get enough CDL drivers, which is causing deliveries to be late, overtime to be high, and truly cost to deliver skyrocketing. Yeah, That's problem, not enough CDL drivers, impact, what all of those things are causing. That is one sentence of the email. And then we go to the next line in this. So that's that's what we're going for here. Yeah. yeah. So I have a framework reply method, but it's very similar to mm-hmm. this in terms of structure. It's like personalization, the empathy part is speaking to the current state, talking about some priority that they're focused on, and then kind of tagging it back. I want to share my screen. This is a, an email. It's working pretty good for a client, but I would love your guys' just like take on this. And I also want people to just kind of see uh, what good looks like, and then also feel free to critique it, uh, you two as well. So this is an email that goes out to a woman that heads up uh, customer support at this company. So the trigger is they just rolled out Microsoft Teams as a way to give their clients a way to, which is kind of weird, their clients a way to call their customer support team and get the feedback they need. So there's kind of the structure. 
and word count, but what's first impressions of this? What do you guys like? What do you think could be stronger? And again, this is an email that's pre- this structure at least is performing uh, pretty pretty good um, for this persona for them right now. So I would one thing I would split test right. All this is testing. I saw not great open rates with questions in the first line. So I tried that for a lot. I was like, how like asking a question in that first line versus making it more of a statement. I know Windstream just integrated into Teams. So making it more of it. So I would split test that again, just see, right? Like how that would work there. Questions in my openers didn't work very well um, in terms of going through. So split test it, see. Um, I would take out, I ask because, right? I'd take out any sort of fluff if I can, just like short and sweet. Support executives are sharing a focus on reducing. I love this, but it's challenging. Love that. Relevant. Used to help. Used to our help. Yeah. So I love, I love a lot of this. My only other like, like change to split test. I would take that other, the second sentence, and I'd break that into two sentences. So at but, I'd make that a whole other line for readability. So I would drop that down for read. And I don't know if this is the actual format, right? I know it's on a Word doc right now, but I would make it readable. And then I would split test the call to action as well. Can I get a shot to tell you how we might help versus are you dealing with this right now at all? And see which one gets a higher response rate. Yeah, I love that. It's actually a good point uh, question there. Uh, Kevin, you may have this data, so I put it on the spot, but percentage of emails open on the phone versus on the laptop? And how that affects formatting. Mm. So um, I thoughts assume, on that with this template. Yep, that's that's why I, I created that second line. The vast gotcha. majority of emails are opened on phone now, so I'm going to assume it's opened on the phone, and hope it gets opened on like a computer. But that's why I broke that second line up because on a phone that will be even chunkier and harder to to read. So there we go. Yeah. So like, yeah, hell yeah, JB. Right. Like right here, like that would, that right there is hard to read on the computer. It looks great mm-hmm. on the phone. It does not. Yeah. Yeah. My, my two cents on the opening line. I don't like the question, but I like leading with humor as much as I can. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure you're having a great time implementing teams right now. Right, right. Um, or something. Yeah. yeah, right. It's like everyone loves implementing a new technology or like, yeah. hey, I'm sure this is going 100% without a hitch. If you're like nine, ten, nine out of 10 of the customers I talk to, right, there's maybe one thing that comes up for the most part, hope it's going smooth. The reason I'm reaching out is because if you are experiencing this 1% of the issue, this is how we could help. So I like putting them in like that specialized bucket, right? It's like, hey, we're not for everyone. But if you're part of this percentage that we can really help, right? Hopefully they get a smile, like, oh God, integrations with teams. Don't even want to talk about it. But like, yeah, we actually are running into some issues. Looks like we are a little bit special, right? And if I can put them in that special bucket, like, hey, if you're one of the companies that are, you know, struggling with this still, here's how we can help. So it gives them a little bit of FOMO too, right? It's like, oh crap, other companies are already solving this. Like maybe I should reach out. Like that'd be my only two cents of the subject line of no, I'm sure Teams integrations is going great. Nine out of 10 people that we connect with usually don't need help in this, but this is the area that we do help out with. Is this something that you're experiencing right now? If so, here's how we solved it for this company. Yeah. You know, let me know if I could be a resource for you. I like that as my call to action. Like, let me know if I could be a resource for you. Or for me, I'd like, hey, feel free to forward this to your sales team to reach out to me. I can be a resource to give them free leads. Um, and that usually gets forwarded. I get like 20, 30 opens, right? If I send it to like a manager, it's like, hey, reach out to this guy. He's going to give us free leads. We don't have to sign up. And then I use all that ammo to reach out to the person that I actually want to reach out to and say like, hey, your team emailed me left and right looking for leads or looking for this sort of data. Yeah. Dude, you guys, I could talk to you for another hour about uh, cold email. Let's just rapid fire KD first. What's like one you feel like really actionable thing that people could just start doing right away after this? So I'm, I'm going to give, I'll give three because you know me, I can give one. <laughs> but so the, the first is, is the framework. I say work on your KPIC framework. No problem, impact, call to action. That will make your emails better. 
The second two, truthfully, y'all, is like execution is everything in this. If you don't have the time and or capacity to do this, then reach out to a JBay to help with the emails, right? Reach out to a rev shop to help build all the structures, right? Because the copy is one thing. Building all the sequences is a, another. So work out to like rev shop is who I worked with there. Follow Tyson, follow Jesse Wallet that talk about this stuff and execute on it. So that, those would be my recommendations. KPIC is first from there that it's like, get help. Like we covered a lot in one hour. We could have yeah. gone for another three. Get help from Jay. I send people to Jay Bay for emails because he's one of the few people I trust to write other good emails, right? So work with someone to help and then let somebody help build it for you. That would be my recommendation to everybody listening. Love it. Tyson, what about you? What's what's something that people can, uh, besides connecting with us on LinkedIn, which we dropped the <laughs> yeah. uh, links in there, blow us up, you guys. Uh, Tyson, what's yeah. one thing that people can take away before they take off? Um, actually, I'm going to steal something that you said at the beginning about how you time manage your day. Um, if this is the first time you thought about educating yourself on email deliverability, call it a week, a month, right? Kevin had a good uh, tidbit at the beginning when we were prepping. It's like block off time once a week to, to talk with leadership about email deliverability. Educate yourself. You don't have to like pay for a resource every time, although it's going to be really impactful, but do it. A, B, test your emails, review copies, review responses, talk to people in the organization. And if you're an AE getting meetings from an SDR, like, you know, ask them if there'll be a resource. Hey, what did you think of that email? What caught your eye? Like, it's okay to ask your prospects for feedback as well on stuff that works or doesn't work, right? A lot of times I'll call people and say like, hey, looks like I missed the mark. You know, would love any feedback that you have on, on where I maybe missed the mark on this email. Great. I'm implementing that on the next 10 cents. So just, you know, too often I hear people join these, you know, download an article, never put it into practice. And then six months later, right, they're behind on their number and be like, oh, I better figure out how to send emails again. It is a constant, constant thing, right? Every single week, cold calling, emailing best practices, find an article, educate yourself. Absolutely. Hey, we're out of time, you guys. Tyson, KD, thank you so much for spending an hour with us and everyone else. I love the engagement. We will send out a recording and thank you, Zoom Info, for sponsoring this webinar. We'll uh, we'll yep. see you guys soon. Later, everyone. See yep. See ya. See ya.